I'm Zach. And I'm Darcy. We're an LDS couple who struggled with unwanted pornography in our marriage for many years. What was once our greatest struggle and something we thought would destroy us has become our greatest blessing and triumph. Our hope is that as you listen to our podcast each week, you'll be filled with hope and healing and realize that you too can thrive beyond pornography and create the marriage you have always desired. Welcome to Thrive Beyond Pornography. We're so glad you're here and we believe in you. Hey everyone, we did a podcast episode with our friend Richard Osler from Listen, Learn, and Love. We really enjoyed doing these interviews with people. We always love helping people you know, figure out how can I leave pornography behind. And Richard is such a great host and he's done such a great job in addressing issues within the LDS community that are difficult to address. So we wanted to share that episode with you. Feel free to check out his podcast, Listen, Learn, and Love. We also wrote a, an essay in his latest book, Listen, Learn, and Love. I think it's the second version. So he did Listen, Learn, and Love, the first version, and then there's a, a follow-up version to that. So go ahead and check that out. You can probably find it on Amazon. And if you're struggling with pornography, please set up a free consult with me at zachspafford.com slash work with me. Thanks to all of you who listen to this podcast. And here is our interview with Richard Osler. <laughs> Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Listen, Learn, and Love, hosted by Richard Osler. Joining me um, via Zoom is our returning guests, um, Darcy and Zach Spafford. Welcome back to the podcast, you two. Hey, we're glad to be here. Yes, we are. Um, We're going to talk about overcoming porn and thriving, Um, not just surviving, but actually thriving and uh, Zach and Darcy Spafford, um, we're on episode 376. That was recorded in January of 2021, so roughly two years ago. Um, you can find Zach and Darcy at Zach Spafford, Z-A-C-H, Spafford.com. We'll put that in the show notes, and they may talk about that. Um, these two are also part of the book I wrote. I wrote a book, the second book, Improving Latter-day Saint Culture, and one of the chapters in there is ending pornography use chapter four and they were brave enough to have an excerpt in there and and as we've been visiting ahead of time i've just loved this couple they're active latter-day saints but they're so brave and vulnerable to talk about zach's porn use and it's not just zach and darcy's off another part of the house and this is sort of your deal zach you talk about it you know they're walking this road together and i think that helps other couples as a YSA bishop, obviously everybody's not married. So um, we were talking mostly to men, but some women about this. And if that wasn't solved before marriage, that would come into marriage. But I like that this is helpful because I think there's a lot of people that are working through this while married and don't quite know how to navigate this with a spouse. So we said a prayer listeners, if you're working to solve porn, if you're working to help someone solve porn, if you're a parent that want to have better framework to teach this when you're home and all your kids right now are really young, but you want to get ahead of this. Um, If you're a local leader, a young woman's leader, um, I just really think the things Zach and Darcy will share will help you in this really important subject. That's part of our community. So is that okay for an introduction? Yeah, absolutely. And if people want us to come talk at their firesides, at their ward, at their, we love doing that. In fact, Darcy has only ever spoken in sacrament one time, <laughs> but she loves to speak in uh, in meetings like Fifth Sunday meetings or firesides for the youth. It's it's kind of extraordinary, to be honest. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I would love it until we did it, and it was awesome. You're it really her up. brave. But you're really vulnerable, and you ro- role model. I think important attributes within our community to bring hope and healing and authentic connection. So. Um, share your story where, you know, your story's kind of out there. You could start from scratch. You could kind of tell the things you've learned new and where you are or both. It's all yours. Yeah. Well, first, thank you for having us on. We love having this conversation because for us, this is, it's not just uh, what we do for a living, but it's, it's literally uh, to us. It's, it's the most meaningful way that we can contribute to the world. We have spent a lot of years working on ourselves and on uh, moving beyond pornography and moving beyond uh, the sense of betrayal that Darcy had. In fact, you know, I think if we start 
at the beginning, it was, it was a rough beginning. You know, Darcy thought I was a different husband than, than the one that she married because I all of a sudden came out with this porn problem and she didn't know how to deal with it. I didn't know how to deal with it at the time. And we did everything. I, I can tell you, we did everything. We went to meetings. We worked with the bishop. We worked with counselor after counselor after counselor. I think we went through what, five bishops? I think we counted. I think it was, it was six. Like five or six. Yeah. It was just, it was a lot. And until we started to figure some things out, we struggled mightily in our relationship and personally in terms of just like getting away from pornography. And for Darcy, it wasn't just, um, you know, it wasn't just Zach has a porn problem, but it was this deep sense of betrayal. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I just, it was just this constant cycle of, you know, I'd get to a place where I felt okay. And then once again, he would look at porn and it would shatter my world. And I didn't know how to move forward from it. And I, I just felt so stuck. I felt trapped being a stay at home mom with, you know, not a whole lot of resources. I, I just felt like stuck. And I got to this place where I just didn't want to feel this way anymore. I wanted to, to get to a place where this wasn't something that was so shattering that I couldn't function and, you know, that was kind of how we started to, sh- to shift and change things from, you know, this being Zach's problem to this being like our problem. This is you and I, we work together, like we're a team. You know, I think we have so many different trials that come in life and we always work together as a team. Uh, but when it came to pornography, there was very much this sense that this is your problem, figure it out. Like you've done this to me and, and I get it. Cause man, who oh, I felt it. Like I felt those feelings. Like I, and I'm not saying if that's where you're at, that you're in the, the wrong place because I totally was there. But when we, when we became a team on this, we began to thrive and we began to see changes that we didn't see before that it, it just wasn't even possible before it was, so much working against each other instead of working together. Yeah. Yeah. I I think the first component that, that we came out with, like as, as I was learning how to solve for my pornography struggle was reframing the entire problem. I mean, what, what have we all been told? Porn is an addiction. If you look at porn, it's going to destroy your family. You know, the, the, the lessons that we've had in church, how many of them are, you know, I know this couple that got divorced and I know this guy who is in jail and all of that deeply, deeply fearful language that makes it so that we think about, oh, if I ever look at porn and think about our children, think about the youth of, of our, of our wards who uh, 99% of them are going to see pornography before they graduate from high school. And I haven't talked to a single mom that has teenagers in the home that hasn't on some level been struggling with pornography. Right. I also, every student that I talk to that calls me from BYU, that's dating a guy, <laughs> they're oh. struggling with pornography, <laughs> right? Like this is not, this is not a problem that makes you special, right? This is a problem nowadays that makes you normal you know it sounds horrible to say it that way but it is a struggle that I feel like across the board people are dealing with and you know for so many years we've dealt with it in this sense of like you know you're you're broken you're bad you're dirty you're all the things that we messaging yeah right that we've had around this and it's like no like you're pretty normal you're pretty normal if you struggle with this. But also, if it's not something you want to struggle with, there is a way away from it. And, and think- it's not based in fear, in punishment, in willpower, in, you know, beating yourself up about it. You know, there that's just not what helps us change. You know, it's like if you're <laughs> the fat, like hating yourself never made you skinny, right? Like... That's just not how it works. And, and I think, you know, from a, from a gospel perspective, the truth is uh, the atonement has paid for this mistake. Uh, it's paid for every time that you make this mistake. It's paid for every time you ever will make this mistake. And that's, 
that's that to me has allowed me to say, okay, I'm going to look forward. And if I can look forward instead of backward at all the mistakes I'm making, then I can actually deal with the problem as it sits. And so instead of making it this deeply shameful moral problem, if we can instead make it a behavioral problem that no longer fits our values, that no longer sits in a place where it helps us be better. Um, most of the people who are choosing pornography in the very beginning, they're doing it from a position of curiosity. It's interesting. And I, I don't know of anyone who is at first just curious about pornography. Once it graduates to a place where it is helping you manage your day or manage your sexuality or manage something uh, in terms of your emotions or what have you, that's a good place to go, okay, this is not just a moral problem that I don't like because it's not part of my um, religious identity. It is now something that is a behavioral structure that I've built in as a habit, and I need to figure out a behavioral uh, process to remove it. And that's available. In fact, there's really good science around this. That's the science that we work with that says, hey, if we can think about this slightly differently, and again, that's not saying well, put aside your morals. It's thinking about it in a way that allows you to address it and allows you to confront it in an open and objective way, puts you into a position where now not only am I seeing the behavior for what it is, which is a is a emotional management technique, I can now learn how to manage those emotions without it. And that's, you know, reframing it into that context allows us to do so much more to get into a position where we can move beyond pornography, right? Because if you can't think of the, um, the, the some of the research, uh, I think it's out of Case Western University shows that the more we think of ourselves as religious the more likely we are to think of ourselves as, as an addict uh, on, on all kinds of different levels, right? And one thing that I've learned about the addict ethos is that it's in a very real sense, it's a position of I'm a victim of something outside of me. There is something outside of me that is more powerful than me. And, I, and I've often said this to people. So when was the last time that pornography like just showed up to your house chained you to a chair and they said, we're going to get naked and you're going to watch. <laughs> That's never happened. So it, pornography isn't more powerful than you. It's not capable of making you do anything. What it is, is you've created a, ha a habitual structure within your life that says, if I choose pornography, I know I can feel good right now. And I don't have to feel lonely, frustrated, sleepy, hungry, tired, whatever it is, right? Disappointed. Disappointed. Any of those things, stressed. I can control how I feel for a brief period of time. And that is something that helps me get through the day. Now we reframe it into, yep, yeah, that's what it is. You're, you're using this. Pornography, what, you, you know, food, same thing. Video games, same thing. Social media. Social media, same thing. You're using these dopamine uh, boosters, as it were, to help you feel good right now for a period of time. That's all it is. Now, if I can learn how to feel bad, which is a terrible message, I'll be honest with you. That is like the worst. <laughs> it's the worst sales pitch in the world. I'm going to help you learn how to feel bad so you don't choose porn anymore. <laughs> because nobody wants to feel bad. Nobody wants to learn how to feel bad. But that's an, an integral part of the process is learning how to deal with how we feel. And by the way, when you learn how to feel bad, you actually feel bad less because it's not a compounding effect over time where when you avoid feeling bad, you actually compound that negative emotion over time and you compound it. So like, uh, for instance, if I feel lonely and then I choose porn, well, I've controlled for loneliness for a period of time, but the porn goes away eventually and the loneliness stays. And then I add on top of that loneliness, frustration that I'm not living my values, stress that I might be ups upsetting my partner and other emotions, other negative emotions, maybe guilt or shame that compound that negative emotion over time. When that happens, guess what? I've actually made it worse and I've made my negative feelings, you know, four times as, as, uh, as frequent in my life as if I had learned how to deal with feeling that loneliness up front. Uh, listeners, this is stuff I wish I'd heard a long time ago. 
Um, <laughs> you know my journey of being a YSA bishop and the first, I got set apart, the stake president left, and the first guy I can still remember him um, wanted to talk about porn use. And we talked about that for the whole time of my assignment. And to be honest, I didn't have a lot of tools to talk like Darcy and, and Zach are talking. I didn't have this kind of training. And I, um, if I'd known what I know now, I think I could have helped the YSAs. And this whole um, curiosity seems to resonate um, mm-hmm. And I think there's intentional curiosity and unintentional exposure to porn that occurs in a home. And I would agree that most youth are, are seeing porn either intentional or unintentional. It's probably hard to go to high school and not have someone put a phone in front of you. And so you're not seeking it out, but you seek. And if there's a curiosity. It's probably a normal thing to be curious. And I think we shouldn't shame people for being curious. It's how we're wired. It's how God created yeah. us. But then, then the link you made... And I'm just repeating what you said for our listeners that may or may not be helpful is this becomes an emotional management te- technique. It's um, I, a therapist talked about the bottom of the iceberg is what we see at the top of the iceberg is porn use. But you have to get to somebody that can help you get to the bottom of the iceberg and feel what really understand what you're coping with or trying to escape from. Mm-hmm. And maybe you can do that on your own and maybe your priesthood leader can do that, your parents. But sometimes you need people like Darcy <laughs> And Zach and other people um, that are in this space that have, and p- people that have walked this road and are vulnerable in their own story to help you get to the bottom of your ice cream and develop better behavioral techniques or better understanding of what there needs to be solved long term so you can um, end porn use. And you probably aren't addicted is my experience. We quickly, um, I think, assume that label. And perhaps I saw a lot of YSAs. Um, as when they did get to the bottom of the iceberg, I did see some just, it just ended and, and others it didn't, but you know, the shame and the guilt and I've, and I don't want to make this about my experience working with people on this, but I, you know, I've always felt, you talked about looking forward, Zach, and I've always felt the savior wants us to look forward and not think we're back at the starting line every, if we mess up. And I think the say, um, mm-hmm. Satan wants us to look backward. And if we relapse or lapse, we could talk about difference in the two, think we're back at square one. Yeah. And I think it's like one of the guests in that chapter talked about, it's like a spiral staircase that goes up and you're not back at the bottom of the staircase if you mess up. Um, and sometimes the language in our church culture gets, creates that feeling. Um, but mm-hmm. I think you're on this long spiral staircase to put porn use behind you. And, and it's not every time you mess up, you're back to square one but maybe you're one step closer to put putting porn use behind you. So I want to make sure. And I, so, and I, I'm curious because Darcy seems to be talking to BYU um, women about their boyfriend's porn use. And I get a few of those calls. I mean, I'm in this space a little bit, Yeah. but I'd love you to give, because I'd love you to talk to single people who are finding out their, their, it just about get engaged or they're engaged or maybe they're married. Maybe the same principles apply, but yeah. And I don't want to shift this podcast to what I want to talk about. Cause I really want it to be what you want to talk about, but so you could talk about the general advice you give people as they reach out to you. Cause you're the spouse or you could just talk whatever both of you want to continue to talk about. Yeah. I'm, I'm all for it. One thing that I thought of when you were talking about that staircase is I was working with a, a woman and she, was struggling with her husband choosing porn. And uh, she mentioned, she said, you know, he, it's been a year and a half, right? And he went a whole year and a half without looking at porn. And he looked at porn this one time and like, they're just back to square one. Right. And I, I brought up to her, he just didn't look at porn for a year and a half. Like that's freaking awesome. Right. Like, Seriously, if there's anything that you struggle with and you go in a year and a half without that struggle, that's amazing. You know, I feel like we spend so much time in this space just expecting perfection all the time, right? We just want perfection. And I just, I feel like we need to celebrate more our wins because when all we're focusing on is that, you know, one time that, we messed up and we didn't live in line with who we want to be. 
we don't have to let that be the thing that just takes us downstream and, you know, washes us, washes us out to the ocean, because that's kind of what happens is, you know, you have one instance and it's just like, you let that one moment just drag you out to the ocean. And I love that. And I would say that one instance uses a learning experience. Yeah. You messed up and yeah, you've gone a whole year and a half, but don't, the narrative is you're back to square one and all the work you've done and all the repenting is off the table now. And why even try? Because I messed up and I might as well just yeah. binge porn because I'll never put this I'm never going to be perfect. So I'll just give up. And I've always felt mm-hmm. like some of the best character moments, I, Neither none of us on this podcast are inviting anybody to mess up. But if you do, what do you do next? And can you step back and say, what did I learn? What were the cumulative effect? Mm-hmm. What were the... What's the backstory why this was a mess up and what can I learn from it? And I think that's, yeah. and so I can just add to my knowledge base of how I can improve my emotional management techniques, use um, Zach's words to just move forward. So, but I'm talking too much. You're the experts. <laughs> yeah. No, we, we love a back and forth conversation. <laughs> we're good. We're easy going. We're totally go with the flow. But so. Go back to what you tell a BYU. So yeah. the BYU so guy's one, looking at porn. The girl is like, oh, I got, he's really a good yeah. guy, but he's looking at porn. Should I marry him or not? Yeah. What do you say? Yes. Oh, that's, that's literally the lines every time, <laughs> every single time. And you, so, you've heard this conversation, yeah. have you, Richard? <laughs> he's a really good guy, but he's looking at porn. Yeah. yeah. I mean, return and, missionary. And, he's got great. Yeah. I mean, you've heard the list, all this stuff, but yes. Yeah. yeah. So tell, talk to those people. I, I <laughs> am always like, I like to say that there's kind of two people that look at porn, but there's probably more than that. But for the most part, I think a lot of them are really good men that struggle with porn. Just like for women, there's a lot of really good women that struggle with things like weight or shopping or, you know, even just comparison, right? Just comparing our bodies to everything that we see on the internet that can become like this constant thing that we do or trying to keep up with those around us, right? And so we, we all struggle and I totally lost my train of thought there. ADD, sorry. <laughs> but I will go back to, I know what your original question was. But for me, I just say, yeah, yeah. If you struggle, if he struggles with porn, that doesn't mean that he's not a good guy and that he doesn't have amazing potential. And also how awesome and brave that he was willing to share that with you. Because so often... It's hard. It's hard to talk about this stuff, right? Like you, you think about the messaging that we've received around this and it's a lot of it is pretty doom and gloom. And it's like, if I share that part of me with someone that I really care about, I have the potential to lose this person, right? So just that character of that young man to come to you and tell you, I struggle with pornography to me, that's huge. That says something pretty dang awesome about that young man because he could lie, right? He could totally lie. And I think that my generation, my age group and above me, for sure above me, they just lied about it, right? They were not honest about it. They were deceitful about it. And for a lot of them for 20, 30, 40, 47 years is the longest that I've ever met someone that finds it out, right? So props for that young man being honest, first of all. Second of all, I, I, I don't want this to sound doom and gloom, but I'm like, this day and age, I think that it's pretty common. A lot of the young men and a lot of the young women struggle with pornography. So but I think it's important to recognize that just because someone doesn't view pornography doesn't make them perfect. And the truth is, you know, you've got... You've got a significant percentage of the population viewing pornography on a regular basis. So if you're finding someone who doesn't view pornography, that's, that's, not, that's not a bad thing, obviously. That's great. But that doesn't make them necessarily a perfect person. And you know, if the only criteria here is, do you look at porn? Then one, you're not going to find a lot of potential partners. And two the potential partners that you find aren't necessarily any better than the ones who are choosing pornography. So it, it's, I think it's a, it's a false, uh, it's a false issue when it comes to this at some level, because 
and and we've seen this. We've seen men who go into their marriage that didn't struggle with porn, and ten years into it, fifteen years into it, all of a sudden they find pornography. I I actually worked with a, a stake president. He was a former stake president who, after he became a stake president, started to view pornography partly because he had been having these conversations and he didn't understand what was what this was all about. It had never been a, a part of his life, and he ended up. Uh, becoming someone who chose pornography on a regular basis because it helped him deal with some stress. And at the end of the day, that doesn't mean he was a bad guy. What it does mean is he needs to learn some new and different emotional management techniques. And I think, I think it's really important to recognize, especially for, for the wives or the women or the, the partners who are listening to this, it does feel bad. It's going to feel bad not because it's supposed to, but because you're human. And if we aren't willing to risk, we are never going to have intimacy. Intimacy requires that we know someone, know who they really are. And if you're not willing to know who that person is and they're not willing to share with you who they are, you're never going to have real intimacy, which is one of the big things that we work on with, especially with couples. You can never get to a thriving marriage if you cannot really have a an open dialogue about this is how I felt today. And this is, uh, I know for us, there was a lot of time I spent not telling Darcy what was going on part, not, not around pornography. Even it was just like, I was at work and I was stressed and, you know, big projects, you know, I worked for a large insurance company and I had multi-million dollar projects that I was dealing with. I, I, you know, at one point I literally had like $18 million in checks on my desk once. I mean, the big, important components of this company's uh, budget. And I would be stressed and Darcy would be like, are you going to get fired? Anytime I was stressed, that was her, <laughs> her response, right? <laughs> are you going to get fired? I don't know why. Well, I do know why. Because she's anxiety. anxious. Right. <laughs> so for each of us, we had to learn. And I think this is a huge component of the part that Darcy does with the wives. It's like learning how to move through that betrayal, through those bad feelings and not lose yourself in what's going on for him, but being able to be a solid individual in yourself and deal with the, that, that those feelings of betrayal and deal with those feelings of, of anxiety. Now back to the question. Sorry, back to the question. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> so I think another huge component for these young couples is just being willing to have open and honest conversations around this topic. And, and just realizing the value in that. But I also like to say that it's like, yes, like you might be okay right now, you know, in this, this struggle with pornography and you're, you know, when you're in in the dating world, you know, sometimes we think like, well, once we get married and we can have sex, then this will go away. And so I always like to point out that this really isn't about sex. This is not what this is about for them. And so knowing and I want them to know going into it that just because they can have sex does not mean that this problem solved because that is often what I think we think when we don't have a lot of education around pornography and and just healthy sexuality in general we think oh this will solve the problem because this is the problem right and so just and then also having that conversation of realizing that yeah it actually might be harder and a little bit more painful when you do get married if they do struggle with pornography because, you know, your frame around it oftentimes for women is like, you know, I am sexual with my husband and it, as a way of, say, managing his urges or managing his behavior, which is a very bad frame to be in. But I think for a lot of us LDS women that grew up in conservative um religions or just community sometimes we get those messages of like you know never say no to your husband because if you do he'll turn to porn or he'll have an affair or you know and so uh, a lot of the younger couples that I work with that's that has been their frame around sexuality and around managing their husbands and so just realizing that that you really don't have control over what your spouse or your partner chooses when it comes to pornography. There's nothing that you can say necessarily do sexually that's going to solve for this problem. 
um, is a huge a huge topic to discuss. But I think it's really important to let go of managing other people emotionally, mentally, all of that. And we get that message, I think, from a pretty young age or our young women have been given that message pretty regularly. Like if you wear a a bikini to the ward uh, pool party, then the boys are going to see that and you need to help out the boys, right? Like, that's that's uh, that's a nonsensical message on uh, you know in the first place, but in the second place, it it's antithetical to agency and also to the reality, which which is simply, I can't manage anything anyone thinks ever, regardless. So for me to change the way I dress or change the way I interact with my partner sexually to try and manage them is a losing battle all the way through. Yeah. And it really becomes like a control strategy, right? Like if, if I somehow think that I have more control over my partner's choices than I really do, like we like control. Everybody likes to have control. You and so like control, you've never, <laughs> <laughs> right. But it's That's like, true, you know, it's, if, if we think if I can just control everything, then everything will, will be okay. Right. And so, yeah, that's, that's a big part, but also just realizing like, look at other qualities outside of just like their struggle with pornography. Yes, they struggle with pornography, but they also are dang good at honesty, right? Like honesty is a huge quality. I think sometimes we, you know, we have this like hierarchy of, of what is sins or sin or not sin or a big sin or a little sin or this or that. And you know, that that's something that I've tried to see is like, even in my children, right? Like, yeah, like they might make bad choices, but like if they're honest with me about their bad choices, why do I want to focus on their bad choice when I can praise their good choice, which is their honesty? You know, because one, I think what we focus on grows, you know, that from a psychology perspective that we know that, right? Whatever we're focusing on becomes the focus and it grows. And so, you know, make, mostly focusing on wins and where we're, where we're, where we're winning versus always focusing on our losing and how we are not doing good enough or we're not perfect yet. Um, Another thing is, is just realizing that this isn't something that has to destroy your marriage. Like really, it really doesn't. It can be something that can help you grow together as a couple and strengthen you and, Um, create something beautiful that you never even thought was possible. I think if you think of the challenges in the trials that any marriage has ever had, right? Those who work through those trials together and are a partner in growing through that trial, how much better are their relationships? How much more uh, intimate are they? How much more uh, willing are they to see their part, the good good in their partner Whereas when I think the current environment, or at least in part the current environment of pornography struggle is adversarial. You fix this problem so I can feel better. And if you don't fix this problem, our eternal marriage is dissolved, right? That's an adversarial relationship that, that puts all the burden on one person that, which it is his responsibility I'm not saying it's not, and I'm not saying that it's her responsibility to manage him, but if I can be a partnership in that, if, if, you know, the spouse, and this is one thing that Darcy has done extraordinarily well is she has stopped saying, why don't you stop this? And started saying things like what's going on with you and being curious about what was happening, happening for me, what changed for me in that day, or what was it that made you go choose pornography? And, and, you know, we've been doing this for years now, but I can tell you without that help, the work was harder. It was harder because I felt like she didn't want to know. And if I told her, she would freak out. Whereas, you know, if you think of other trials that you've had in your life, say cancer, somebody has cancer, what do they do? They don't not tell their spouse. And then their spouse is left wondering, well, why are you sick and dying all the time? And they don't tell them. They say, hey, this is what's going on for me. And the spouse is, well, how can I help you with that? How can I cure it from a position of curiosity? How can I help you solve this? 
how can I support you in your challenges? Right. Because she can't cure cancer, but she can be a participant in the growth of, uh, of, of the partnership through that trial, mm-hmm. which is a totally different framework, I think. I just, you know, I'm, this is really helpful um, to have both of you talking about this together. It's a beautiful love story. I assume when you got married, you didn't ever imagine you'd be on podcast talking about <laughs> Zach's porn use. <laughs> If you had told me five years ago that this is what we would do for a living and that we would be constantly telling everybody about how I used to look at porn and how uh, I nearly destroyed our marriage, man, I would have said you're a moron. (laughs) But there's a lot of really wonderful golden nuggets in there and it takes work on both of your parts. But one of the themes I've gotten that's probably the most touching is the the skills you've developed in your marriage to grow close together because of this challenge and perhaps the ability to communicate, be vulnerable, find common ground, validate mm-hmm. and sort of see each other's individual roads. My guess if it was a way to merit measure your marriage pre or post you've developed skills that make your marriage stronger. Now we wouldn't, no one on the podcast is inviting anybody to look at porn to make their marriage stronger. Please don't. Um, <laughs> now, but well, the, the, the truth talent. is, is that these skills work with all yeah. sorts of challenges, right? It's not just about pornography, and if it's not pornography, then it's another challenge, right? But the like, ability none to be, of us the ability to be vulnerable and work together and see it as our problem, and it's a, it's different. You have betrayal trauma, and you know that's real, and I sense you get that, and Zach gets that, yeah. and knows the. We could probably have Zach for the next 20 minutes talk about the pain and you could of this. So we're not minimizing that, but yes. it's also you're working with Zach and saying, you know, we're, we're partners in this because we're partners in everything. And then, mm-hmm. then your ability to help others, which you felt impressed to get in this space and actually talk about your story. It'd be one thing just to sort of get to a good spot in this and then move on. But you felt, and that's, I'm thinking of your kids and just the principles you're teaching in your family and your grandkids when they come and your faith community, mm-hmm. just because what you're doing, it teaches how to, help. and I think pornography personally, I think it's peaking, not because your generation, especially the younger generation is the first one sort of dealing with it 24 seven. That was not something yeah. that was possible when I was growing up. And so I think porn use has increased compared to my generation, but the tools to solve it yeah. are residing in your generation because you're walking the road and you can then, because you walk, and especially the younger people that are walking this road single and growing up, they're becoming the parents and leaders of tomorrow that'll talk like you talk about this in their families and mm-hmm. their communities. And I think that's why I think it's, it is peaking or has peaked because of just better ways we're talking about it. So my feeling about is your answer to that BYU co-ed is I like to not get my sort of like between their revelation and heavenly father. So I'd give them a principle based decision, a principle, not a decision, principle based, just like you did a set of things to think about and they need to get their own revelation. I think it's possible they'd get a revelation to break up the relationship. I don't think anybody's saying stay in the relationship. If he's looking at porn, if he's a good guy, you still could get the revelation to end the relationship, but you may get the revelation to not. And I think our job as outsiders is not to be prescriptive and say, and give binary black and white rules. Like if there's these three things missing on that person's checklist, they're out of there. And I, and we're looking more at their attributes and their characteristics versus outside checklist things. Cause sometimes the outside checklist things don't lead to the character we're looking for. And both of you kind of have that character because you've the road you've walked. So that's my thought on that question. Um, Yeah. And I also just think that, um, sorry, I'm, you just distracted me. Sorry. You're going to edit this, right? (laughs) No, we don't edit. It's like going out of lunch and we're just having a conversation. (laughs) No, um, I, I just think that the day of just discounting someone because they struggle with pornography, I don't think is very wise in this day and age, right? You know? back in your generation to get pornography, you probably had to go 
find it somewhere. You had to go to a store. You had to maybe go to a friend's house that had a movie that their dad hid under the bed or, you know, like you had to actively seek it out and with risk. Yeah. And search there's usually high other and low involved. for it. Right. Where now it's just in our hands. I, I mean, I was sitting at the counter just, was it last night? And I was, I was typing, I was trying to find someone on Facebook. Right. And like, seriously, all the profiles that came up, I was like, Oh my gosh, like no wonder these kids, Yeah. because I'll be honest, I'm a 40 year old woman. And I was tempted to click on this profile. Cause I'm like, what is this? Like, what am I even looking at? Right. You know? And so I think it's just, it's just there. Like it's just so much more accessible and easy to access it even by accident. Like I wasn't searching for anything suggestive or inappropriate in any way. And, and there it was in front of my face. Right. And so. Talk to parents. You, I'm hijacking your conversation here. So you can talk about it. Totally want, fine. But, um, let talk to listeners that are parents. And so they, they may even have kids that are kind of like eight and younger, which maybe is, a, I don't want to, I don't know where the cutoff is, but let's say their kids are young enough. They probably don't even have access to it at this point. I have a smartphone. None of their friends Mm -hmm. have smartphones. They don't, they're in, and they want to get ahead of the curve here. They recognize this could become a reality of their kids' lives, but they want to develop a family culture that, you know, they're not inviting their kids to look at porn. They don't want them to, but they recognize it may happen, but they want to kind of walk with their kids on this road. So it doesn't become an addiction and, really significantly negative impact their life or their ability to have a temple marriage. And so talk to those parents that want to sort of know how to talk about this in their homes. I would start by saying it is going to happen. It's not a may happen situation. Your child is going to see pornography at some point. And I, and I would call that unintentional or intentional. So I would say unintentional or or I would say my first exposure to pornography was unintentional. Okay. So I found I, it in a, in a truck tire. You know, they used to have these giant uh, uh, dump truck tires on the, on the playground. I'm sure you told this I, story. I, I know I told this story on the last podcast, so you can go back. I don't back remember and, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that's where I found it for the first time. And I was eight and at a time when there was no such thing as the internet. The internet literally did not exist in my mind frame until we moved back from Germany. And this was years before that. So, uh, so they are going... So unintentional exposure. Yeah, they're going playground. to see pornography at some level at some point in in their growing up years. That's and you could tell them that as kids. You say, this is what pornography is, and it's likely that you will just accidentally be exposed yeah. to this. Well, and I think and that's if you a really tell brave me, position. And, this, Start and if there, you tell me, right? this is how I'll respond. Yeah. Well, and and I think just telling your kids, this is what is likely to happen. You may be aroused by it. If you don't know what arousal is, you know, walk through that conversation with them. Uh, you know, and obviously based on their age, it's going to be a different conversation, but being as honest as you possibly can about it. And for a lot of parents who struggle to use words like masturbation and arousal and, uh, sexual intercourse and things like that, erection, erection, uh, you know, vagina instead of, you know, whatever pet name you have, um, If you can step away from the euphemisms and say the words, they become much less uh, mysterious and much more tolerable. And again, it's, you know, obviously no, no, you know, your kids, so you know what level they're at in terms of what you want to share with them, but being willing to openly and honestly tell them your experience this is how it occurred for me. the, The first time I saw pornography, this is what it is like for me, this is what it may be like for you. It may be really jarring for you the first time. I know a lot of young women for whom that was the very, the, their first experience was like, what in the world? Um, and then they started to be curious, more curious and more curious about it. And it became something that they used to manage their emotional state for many young men. It's like, wow, this person really desires me, even though they're an image, right? So talk through those emotions, talk through the realities of it. You know, we put together a course called teens quit porn. You can go to teensquitporn.com if you want to access it, but it is a phenomenal resource that allows people and anybody who's listening to this podcast, if you email me, I will give you uh, access to that for free. If you, if you want, 
So tell us your email. Podcast. Yep. Tell us your email. Uh, Zach d- at ZachSpafford.com. Okay. It's a really difficult one. And we'll put that in the show <laughs> notes just in and case it's you didn't Spafford get it. with a P, not a T. <laughs> right. But but we put together a resource for for uh, young men and young women that they could use to start to learn how to deal with what it is that's going on with them around pornography because we felt it was so valuable. I did it with my friend, Joey, Joey Massio, who has a, um, a podcast called uh, Firmly Founded. No, that's his business. That's, that's his, his business. Firmly Founded is his business. You go to firmlyfounded.com and see him. But uh, but he works with kids, teens, and and their parents on all kinds of things. But we did this specifically on pornography. But if, if you are willing to do the work, which I think every parent needs to be willing to do the work, because nobody's going to be able to teach your kids as well as you are. And if you're willing to step into that role of educating your children around sex, right? So this is what we told our kids. You know, they, one day they were, what were they? They were joking about the number 69 in our kitchen. Uh, and our kids, they had no idea. Yeah, we really were talking meant. about like, what should we do on the podcast this week? And they're like, you could do like 69 ways to blah, 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 or something, you know, stupid. You know, they, they were, were being joking, funny. Right? And I was like, do you know what that means? Yeah. Right. And we just, dove into it i just very plainly said exactly what it is you know in very frank terms and they're like oh i mean i knew it was probably some kind of sexual reference but i didn't really know exactly and i was gonna google it but and i don't want them to google it right so that's another thing that we say to them we say if you have a question come to us we want to answer those questions we don't want google to tell you the answer yeah you know and this is kind of a tangent but my daughter and her friend, they clean together. They're cleaners at the ledges. And they called me one day and I guess there was some TikTok thing about, uh, it was like Target's ad and it for, I don't know, like an ornament or something. Right. And, and they were like, it, it was some reference to like, Oh, Target's got their butt plugs in. Right. Or whatever. And my daughter and her friend called me and because they didn't know what that was, and they wanted to know, they called and they you. were and they were talking between the two of them, right? Because they're like, "What is a butt plug?" And anyway, so they called me. They called and like, you. They called me and they asked me this question. They're sixteen, and I mean, I'm not super experienced on the topic, but I was like, "Well, this is like the basics of what this is," and they're like, "Oh," but they were like, "No, you ask her. No, you ask her. No, you're the one that said." call my mom, you know, like they're going back and forth between the two of them, but they asked me and instead it, of Googling it and as uncomfortable as it kind of is to talk about it. Cause it is, it's not like, it's like, Oh, I love talking about this topic. Right. I just answered their question and they were kind of giggling and being silly and whatnot. But I would, at the end of the conversation, I said, thank you so, so much for trusting me enough to call me and ask me what a butt plug is. I love it. And you can call and ask me any question you want, no matter what it is. I'm not going to freak out. I can handle it. If I don't know what it is, I'll find out and I will help you figure out the answer. By the way, that means as a parent, you have to be willing to not freak out and handle it. <laughs> yeah. Which handle is yourself, you know, which it'd be tough. It, it is. It is. It's hard, but like, cause I recognize we talk about this all the time. We talk about things, not, not butt plugs, but about sexuality and sex all the time. And so, even like, that's not a topic I want to bring up with anybody, but being able to handle the fact that yes, these things exist. And this, I think is kind of the, this is like a mentality that I think we have to bring to pornography and to the process of going beyond the, the addiction language and the, and I'm totally trapped forever is we have this idea that X is bad. Butt plugs are bad. Porn is bad. Uh, This type of sexuality is bad. And if we can set that aside for a second and just say it is instead of it's bad, that gives us so much more room to actually deal with the problems, to deal with the the questions, to deal with the issues. Because if instead of judging ourselves and judging the problem or judging the issue as a, this is negative, this is bad, this is the end of the world. And we make it a, well, it is, it just exists. And now because it exists, I get to talk about it. Well, you might not think I get to talk about it, but it, about it, but uh, I am going to talk about it in as frank 
and open a terms as I possibly can, that is a meaningful place to be. It's no longer, well, because you look at porn, everything's the end of the world. Porn exists. Of course you've seen porn. That's how it is in this world that we live in now. Let's talk about how you may want to deal with it. Totally different mind frame. That was a um, really good segment. Uh, I th one of the things that resonated with me is no one can teach your kids better about sex than you as parents can. I'm paraphrasing what you said, but I think yeah. my generation, see, I'm old enough to, I'm like 20 years older than you guys. My generation <laughs> and maybe your generation, and maybe we do this in all generations, sort of outsource that to the school. School is going to teach mm -hmm. my kids about, I can't even remember that word, baturation. I think that's what it's maturation, called. Maturation, yep. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, the church is going to teach my kids about the law of chastity and there's temple recommend interviews and bishop interviews. And so that's sort of the church's job to teach that and measure how my kid's doing. I don't really going to have those conversations with my kids. And, and some of that's fine. I'm not saying that's not okay, all of that. But I think one of the things that sort of was a light bulb moment for me, and I probably already believe this, but you just articulate it really well, is we as parents are responsible and we have yeah. to develop the vocabulary and the tools to do this, even if it's uncomfortable. And, we, and I love where you just use factual terms that we learn for body parts that are factual terms. There's nothing wrong with using factual terms to describe body parts. Um, and just talking about that very objectively, non-emotionally, non-shaming, not taking you to the bathroom to talk about body parts, just talking to them in a normal conversation and explaining what pornography is in an age-appropriate way. And I've always thought, you know, you know, if, if this happens unintentionally or intentionally, this is how I will respond as a parent if you tell me that. So, and mm -hmm. I, I share that with listeners in a lot of spaces. If you're LGBTQ, you know, you as a parent are going to talk. If you come out to me as LGBTQ at some point in your life, this is the conversation I'm going to have with you next. And it just takes all of that fear out of them. Because they know this is how mom and dad are going to respond. If I'm sexually active, if I mess up with the word of wisdom, we're not in having listeners. I don't think having these conversations with our kids causes them to have curiosity to increase messing up. I actually yeah. think the opposite happens because it's just factual conversations and their curiosity may is muted and they don't go and search Google for these terms. And they're having these. That's why I got tender hearted when your, your daughter called you, Darcy. Yeah. And, and they may not, our kids don't always call us first every time, but when they do, that's really cool. But it yeah. takes skill as us as parents not to be jarred or not to, well, we're not going to talk about that now. I'm talking yeah. really soft language and make them feel shame for asking parents a question. They kind of know, oh, I can't talk to my parents about that because it was, it made me feel shameful for opening up about that. I think our responses need to make sure we don't feel, cause our kids to feel shame as they open up with, so that was really helpful um, for me. And just as I wish I, I listened to some of my guests and I want to be a parent all over again, because all our kids are, <laughs> we're empty nesters now. <laughs> um, hey, you got grandkids. We got, got grandkids, <laughs> but I guess so I'm going to let my kids talk to my grandkids. Yeah. <laughs> We've got time for one more segment. So just what else is on your mind? Both, either of you or both of you could take a segment just in closing what you'd love to share with listeners. I think for me, my closing is that this is not the end of the world. This can, and I say this all the time, this can be something that can truly strengthen your relationship. It's not easy. It is not easy at all. It's not, it takes growing. It takes maturing. It takes being willing to look honestly at your own behavior and where it is that you could grow, you know, because when you're in a marriage, you, you know, my actions affect him, his actions affect me. They're never the cause of his actions, right? So like what I do never makes a difference on what he decides to do because ultimately he gets to choose. He has agency. That's his, that's his choice. But that, this can be something that you learn and grow and, and thrive beyond pornography. That's why we changed our podcast is we had seen, you know, Zach had been working with so many men, you know, a, a few women, but mostly men around pornography. 
and getting to the place where they're doing good, but then their relationship is still struggling. They haven't been able to really move beyond it as a couple. And so that is why we decided to change our podcast to thrive beyond pornography um, and, and make it more focused on the couple because when no matter what it is that you're doing, if you work together, you are always going to be stronger than if you work alone. And that to me was where the growth really came for both of us it, for me and for him. And, and there's still times, like I always like to say, like, you know, people say like, Oh, well, you know, are you saying you'll never have an urge again, or I'll never get triggered or, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it's like, no, like you still live in a world, right? There are still situations that we could walk in that maybe make me uncomfortable or make me feel like or make my body respond in that way where it's like, you know, your heart's racing, your mind starts going, you're, you're, you know, you're hyper-focused on maybe something, you know, a lady nude tanning, you know, at the beach or whatever, right? Like situations like that still happen, but it's more about how can I hold on to my own emotions? How can I work through this and manage myself in the face of what's going on. And, and that's, I think where the, I feel like the greatest work that I've put in has gotten to me to where I am today is being able to respond to situations that are hard in a way that I, at the end of the day, am proud of that. I, I'm like, I showed up in that situation in a way that I respect and that I'm happy with and that I feel good about, you know, when I, when Zach and I were really, really struggling and it was really ugly, I never got to bed at night and thought, wow, I'm, I'm so grateful for how that turned out. That was real good. Right. You know, it was, I had a lot of regret and I, you know, if I sat with myself, I wasn't really proud of who I was being in those moments. And that's, that's hard because it's really, really easy to just blame everything on your partner, no matter what it is, right? We don't like to look at our side of the street very often. It's way easier to look on the other side of the street at what our partner's doing wrong. And, and that's been something that Zach and I have worked really hard on is seeing what it is on our side of the street that we can clean up. And the truth of it is, is that's the only thing that you actually have any control over is how you show up in the world. And so that would be how I would end it. And I think, and I love that because that is, that was not just a a clinical idea that we came up with. It was like our lived experience. It was the reality we had to go through. And it's not just, okay, well, this problem stopped. And so everything became perfect. It was this problem stopped and we still didn't have the relationship we wanted. And so we had to work through a lot of additional components to create the thriving relationship that we have now. And I'm so grateful that, you know, Darcy was willing to do that with me. And, I'm, and you know, the, the people that we work with, that's the thing that they're the most grateful for is that they can move beyond pornography, move beyond betrayal and start to rebuild and create a thriving marriage beyond pornography, beyond the, the struggles, because they, they have a skill set that allows them to hold on to themselves and deal with what's going on, regardless of what it looks like. Thank you. Uh, just a really helpful podcast. You're really brave. You're really vulnerable and you're helping a lot of people. Very um, kind. And I think for every positive message you get, there are probably a hundred that you've helped that have never told you. So those of you like the Spaffords that are out bravely, sharing your story. I think it brings hope and healing and authentic connection. And you're really brave. And I'm glad you do your own podcast. We'll link to um, ZachSpafford.com. You can hear more of their episodes and connect with more of their work. Um, We kind of touched on women that are viewing porn. And we have a woman at a church owned school at a podcast coming up in the next couple of weeks. And I do, we could talk about this, but we don't really have time. I worry about women that are viewing porn and Neither is okay, men or women. It's both a sin, but I worry a little bit for women that there's a little bit of a understanding for men. It's back to 
this conversation, but I hope, so I worry about increased shame for women that are viewing porn. And I'm glad you mentioned that just a little bit, Darcy. And so yeah. everything we've said here applies to women that are viewing porn. And don't feel like you're like, you know, okay, this is a man's deal, but I'm a, there's someone to be really problem with me because I've got a man's problem now. And yeah. don't go down that road. Um, and I'm sure you've got some podcasts to address that. One thing I try to point out when we talk about porn and I brought up LGBTQ is my feeling porn use doesn't change sexual orientation. It's just a window into someone's sexual orientation. So one of the things that I used to hear is, well, you're not straight because you looked at porn. And I don't agree with that. I think it's a window into someone's sexual orientation versus something that can change. Now, I don't invite people to look at porn, but um, that's sort of, I don't think we should look at it that way. So anyway, we will add um, ZachSpafford.com to the show notes and Zach's email and You two are doing great work in our community. Um, Thank Thank you for being on the podcast again, and please connect with their work. I wish, obviously, I'd known about this as a younger parent, as a YSA bishop. Um, This is the toolkit, in my opinion, to get people um, into a different space on this, and it's looking at this from a behavior um, standpoint and what behavior needs to change and what's at the bottom of the iceberg. So um, Darcy and Zach and Richard all signing off from another episode of Listen, Learn, and Love. Thanks for listening to Thrive Beyond Pornography. If you're seeking guidance and support to overcome pornography for good and begin creating a thriving life beyond it, check out my free webinar, How to Overcome Pornography with Skills That Actually Work. You'll learn practical, proven skills guided by an expert coach who has personally overcome pornography. Whether you're getting started for just yourself or along with your spouse, Darcy and I can teach you the tools that will help you put your life on the right path for you. Be sure to check out the show notes for a direct link. And if you could take a moment to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts, it would mean the world to us. Your reviews play a significant role in helping others discover the show so they can join us on this transformative journey. Thank you for being part of the Thrive Beyond Pornography community. Until our next episode, stay strong, stay focused, and keep thriving.